of Letters from the Lighthouse by Emma Carroll. I hope you're sitting somewhere comfortable and you've got a nice warm drink on this chilly morning or afternoon. We just got up to the end of chapter nine where Olive was wondering what the real reason was for why Esther couldn't stay at the lighthouse. So today, let's continue on to our next chapter, chapter 10. This chapter is called Walls Have Ears. That night I lay awake in my unfamiliar bed. Every few minutes when the lighthouse beam turned, the brightness was so strong it came through the blackout curtains, catching the surface of my seashell and making me think of Dad. The last time he'd been home on leave, I'd found him out in our yard, staring at the coal shed. Beckoning me over, he gave me a leg up and told me to look at the bird. It was a pigeon lying amongst the old leaves. It didn't look like, look like the normal grey, greasy feathered kind. This one was a lovely grey colour with white around its neck. It's not moving, I said. The poor thing's dead, Dad explained. From exhaustion, I bet. Or from Gloria's cat. It got two blackbirds and a mouse last week, I told him. Dad pointed to the bird's left leg, which stuck out stiff as a twig from its body. See that metal cylinder? Craning my neck, I could just about see what looked like one of Suki's lipsticks tied onto the bird. The pigeon's probably flown all the way from Europe. There'll be a message inside, something important from the front line. He told me that's what pigeons were being used for nowadays, to send messages from places where the post couldn't reach. Can we open it? I asked. Of course not. Dad sounded horrified and put me down on the ground. That message will be top secret, Olive. We need to hand it over to the authorities as quickly as we can. I couldn't remember what happened next. I called to the Ministry of Defence, I suppose, or the police. What stuck with me was the sight of the dead bird. It must have flown over France, over the English Channel, reaching us just as its little pigeon heart gave out. After all that effort, the least we could have done was read the message. It seemed so important that we did. It felt a bit like that with Suki's note. Not being able to read it was so frustrating. We still didn't know anything about her whereabouts, or even if she was dead or alive. We didn't have the note anymore either. Esther did. Olive? Cliff was awake. Go back to sleep. I turned over to face the wall. Can't. I need to tell you something. Sighing, I rolled over again to see Cliff out of bed and crossing the room towards me. Lifting up the bedclothes, he slipped in beside me, warm as toast and not in the slightest bit sleepy. I got it back off Esther, he whispered, pushing a piece of paper into my hand. Just before she elbowed me, I snatched it from her pocket. It was Suki's note. Thanks awfully! I cried, ruffling Cliff's hair. You're brilliant, you are. So Esther hadn't been lying when she said she didn't have it, because by then Cliff had already got it back. I was thrilled to have it again. Olive, Cliff's tone was so serious suddenly, my stomach tightened. Do you think Esther was right? About what? I asked warily. But I knew what he meant. He read the note again, or tried to. The code made it impossible he was wondering if his sister was a spy. I didn't blame him. She was, after all, the bravest, cleverest person I knew. If anyone could outwit the Germans, I'd put my pocket money on it being Suki. In the books I'd read, though, spies worked alone, whereas Suki had lots of friends, people from her school days, people at work. She had a pen pal, too, who she'd written to every night, though I was beginning to wonder how much of the pal part Queenie was. I breathed deeply. I don't think she's a spy. I don't reckon she went missing in the air raid either. Cliff was quiet as he took it in. Where is she then? I thought about the man she'd met, the foreign map at home in her drawer. About what I'd tried to see on Queenie's table earlier and Ephraim's strict house rules. I don't know, I said carefully, yet. All these things might be random clues. Or they might somehow link together. As we lay there side by side, I could almost feel the uncertainty growing in my mind. Ephraim and Queenie were hiding things from us, 
and Kosuki definitely wasn't the sort to work alone. The next morning, in the bright light of the day, the code looked so simple. Yet whichever way I read it, back to front, upside down, top to bottom, I couldn't work out what it meant. I give up, I groaned. We were in the sitting room part of the lighthouse. The table was full of dirty breakfast things which we didn't dare wash up. Day nine, that's easy. It means in nine days time, said Cliff. I got the sense he wasn't giving it his full attention, not with Pixie at his feet begging for toast crumbs. Very good, clever clogs. Starting from when? He shrugged. The night at the cinema? It was possible, or it could be nine o'clock in the morning, or an unknown date in the past or future. There were so many different meanings, and we were only on the first line. Exasperated, I flopped into the nearest chair. Maybe codes were a bit like crosswords. The more you stared at them, the harder they got to solve. Putting the note in my skirt pocket, I I decided to give my brain a break from it. Pixie by now had gotten bored and fallen asleep and Cliff was gazing out of the window through a pair of binoculars. The room was quiet from this particular seat near the stairs and I soon discovered that I could hear Ephraim at work in the control room above us. The crackles and beeps told me he was talking on a radio. He'd say things like squalls and riptides, knots and coordinates, which sounded impressive, though I didn't know what they meant. The other noise was a familiar click-clack sound that went on long after the radio conversation was over. Yesterday, I'd seen balls of wool here on the sofa, a half-finished sock, needles. Ephraim was knitting, by the sounds of it, very fast. So, said Cliff, when I told him to listen. He turned from the window to look at me through the binoculars. It was rather disconcerting. Everyone knits, don't they? Certainly Mum and Gloria did. They made socks for our troops, but only a few pairs each. Usually it was around Christmas time and they'd parcel them up with chocolate bars and pipe tobacco to send off to British forces, to a British forces address somewhere abroad. It wasn't Christmas now though. And yet upstairs, Ephraim sounded like he was going for a knitting world record. Whoever he was making all these socks for clearly had very cold feet or needed warm clothes in a hurry. And that is the end of chapter 10. I hope you enjoyed that instalment and we have some activities for you to do linking to our Vipers on Teams. So make sure you have a look at those now and particularly make sure that you complete the final question, which is our challenge to do with uh, summarising. And we'd like you to summarise the book so far because we've read 110 pages. So I want to see if you can summarise the book so far in a few words that details are on the assignment. See you again soon. Bye.